Welcome to It's All About the Questions, where learning to ask the right questions can help you achieve lifelong success. Now, here to help you ask all the right questions is award-winning author, international speaker, and business strategist, Laura Stewart. Good morning, afternoon, and evening, everyone, and welcome, welcome, welcome to the show. And I do apologize to all my faithful listeners for not being able to get back on track to regular shows every week on the same day with my health issues and a few other things that have been going on. But I am doing my best to be out there as often as I can for everybody. Um, next week will be the start of my seventh season, seventh year doing this show. So I'm all excited about that. And I love the fact that I have a very dear friend closing out the sixth season with me today on the show. Um, Clint Gatewood has been in the tech industry for as long or longer than I have been in it. And he's been somebody that I've considered a mentor, a guide, a friend, and one of my biggest supporters. And he took a chance on me a really long time ago when my company was really, really small. And I credit him for really helping me to grow the business and have even more faith in myself and my abilities with what I was doing. So I'm not going to take any longer. I'm just going to bring the amazing Clint Gatewood back uh, not back on, but into the show. And um, <laughs> right. we're going to chat. For those watching live, you can chat into the chat pane and we'll be monitoring the chat to um, answer any questions you have or, or listen to the comments that you have. But Clint, so glad you are here with me, my dear friend. Finally, we got, got on here. It was six years. <laughs> into I know, the I know. You know, and We've tried off and on, you know, and there were different things going on at various places and and everything, and it never ended up happening. And then you were like, well, you know, I've never been on it. I'm like, I know I've asked you. And and then we finally made it, and I'm excited that, you know, we're, we're starting to close out my sixth season, entering my seventh season with you on. And, I mean, this is March 23rd, so actually next week is the closeout show because April 1st. Was well, when sure. I started the show. For everything that, you, that I help help with, and you help me in our career, and then I'm the last one. Now I'm not the last one. So. Well, you know, <laughs> I might not do a show next week, but you're 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 the penultimate. Oh well, thank you, thank you. No, but it's been like you said, it's six years, six years since you you know you wrote your book, and that took off really, really well. And uh, I, I love watching you grow that part of your career too, uh, post uh, being a managed service provider and that part of the tech industry to to really helping people across businesses and like. And it took us six years to get here, but it's like life and business and that, that river runs so quickly that you look back and it's like, wow, it really was that much time. Yeah. And you hadn't been on the show, but we talk all the time in real life. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> which, which made it so interesting that I'm like, oh my God, how could, how could this happen? Now, I've watched your career change trajectories, change focus so much over the years, which is why I was so excited to have you here today because, you know, you and I were talking the other day and I'm like, oh my God, I have so many questions to ask you. <laughs> <laughs> you always do. That's why you got the show and you wrote your book. It's all about the question, right? You love asking questions and learning and, and uh, ferreting out what you need to, need to understand to make, to make it go. So. Yeah, and that's something that you are really good at too, is asking questions and and then looking at the answers to see are the answers moving us forward, which is a big part about asking the right questions, right? If you ask the wrong questions, the answers really don't matter. And I mean, you've had this incredible career. You were an army ranger. Yeah. And I think that's where you met your incredible wife was while you were in the army. Right. It was, yes, <laughs> absolutely. Yep, that's right. I was in Panama. I spent three years down there, beautiful country, and uh, I, they, they've gifted me a, a wonderful wife. I've been married to 35 years. It's been great. Yeah, so, I mean, those are, those are moments in a person's life that set a path, right? You, you go into the Army, you meet this woman that you fall in love with, you you marry, you're married for 35 years, you have kids, you get into this tech world where you're working for other people, growing their businesses, then you leave that world and you start your own tech business, and then you go back to helping other people. You've had this career, Clint, of helping other people grow. 
what drove you to do that? And did you see that as your purpose in life, as your quest when you started? I didn't see that as part of the reason I made decisions and moving things forward. I just feel like that's what one does through life, whether it's in your business or it's with your family or friends, you help them move forward. You, when they're asking for help, you give them help or you try to understand where you can help and uh, provide that to them. And it's not always that you're always helping them from the standpoint of giving them stuff, but it's about helping them understand the things that they need to do to become successful and move forward as well. So I just have always enjoyed working with people and growing things together. <laughs> so you never, you know, we, we do a lot on our own and in the way that we have to look at our own personal responsibility for ourselves and keeping our life straight and, and moving those forward and then put you in a really good position to understand and help others as well. So and that's, I just always approach it that way is that as long as you're helping people, they're going to help you. And uh, I push out a lot of the, you know, the younger people working for me right now as well. I talk to them about, hey, you know, you're in the tech industry. You want to be on LinkedIn. You want to be doing this. This is this is what you do. You build the, you build these relationships and you help people grow. And that's your next person that's going to help you. You know, if you have trouble with your career and, you're, and then you lose a job or you get outsourced from a job or something along those lines, it's the the people that help you move forward that you also help move forward at the same time that are going to be there again to, to help you move to that next level or to find that next thing you're going to do in your life. So that's just how I've always just approached life. I remember one time when you were building this incredible partner channel for Zenith Infotech. And I was already a partner of, of the firm and you and I had interacted for years even before that. And I remember I was just kind of watching across the conference center at your booth and watching you interact with people as they would come up and and just really sort of watching your persona and knowing you as a person outside of that and watching you in the booth as you're talking to people and helping. I, I was amazed at one thing because you see this all too rare at conference events like that that the Clint behind the scenes and the Clint in the front of the house was the exact same Clint. That takes a very strong strength of character to be the same way in an environment where basically your job is to close people, to get them to sign on the dotted line because typically your income relies on that or your milestones rely on that. Yet you never seem to care about that. You cared more about having the right people sign up and have the right people <clears throat> in place on your team as well. Can you talk to us some more about that and, and how you've navigated that throughout your career? Yeah, you, you're... I never kind of looked at it in that perspective. <laughs> so uh, in, in how it's the same person, but I don't know. I That's the way I was raised. My dad was that way. Uh, and my mom, there wasn't any, you know, we, we've all had issues that we've gone through in life. And I just don't like hiding behind things. <laughs> I like to, it's, it's about being out front in front of people. But um, back to your point, though, um, I think I lost what I wanted to say there. There's a couple of things I wanted to say, but being that being that same person, I feel when you're authentic and you can live your life. If you if you look at like Sartre, you can live your life authentically or unauthentically, and you can lie to yourself throughout your life. You can lie to others and live unauthentically, or you can live authentically. And I feel just much more comfortable when I'm being myself. There's nothing to be ashamed of who I am or the <clears throat> the feelings that I have or how I feel about government or how I feel about business or how I feel about family. Um, I just feel that if you treat people in, the, in an authentic manner and, and respect them, you don't have to always agree with them. And I think that's another thing that I learned in business that I, I got some of my, my best deals or um, a lot of the business closed in and around me more than me just closing it because you have straight up honest conversations with someone that's running a business and Hey, why aren't you doing this? Or why did you do that? Or, uh, you know, this would do X, Y, and Z for you. It isn't about hard selling someone on things. It's about helping them see 
where it's going to help them in their lives, in their business, how it's going to help grow those things. And it's the same thing in your personal life when you're dealing with people behind the scenes. Um, yes, I don't, I don't know if there's any great carrots of, of knowledge I gave you on that one, but I think, I think the big thing is, is that you just be yourself. People can tell or at least get that feeling when you're not being authentic and you're not the same person you are when you're at home as when you are at business. Um, and so that's, that's how I approach, I approach it. <laughs> you know, it's such an interesting conversation about authenticity and nowadays people with all the social media that's going on out there in the world, you can make one misstep on social media or do something that might be off brand for you, but it was a, a risk you wanted to take, you know, maybe it's doing a crazy dance somewhere or one time you're out in public and you let loose a little bit and somebody puts it out on social media. For you and I coming from the world where not everything was caught on camera and I mean, I really don't think I have a lot in my past that I would be completely mortified <laughs> if it showed up, but I am, I know I do, right? You know, I went to college, we all, we, and yeah, I drank a lot, <laughs> danced on top of bars, you know, I, I did all that, that kind of yeah, stuff. Yeah. I, I hope I've lived my life in integrity and that people would say that I have. What's your advice to the entrepreneurs today that you're dealing with when they're trying to grow a business, knowing that probably their whole past up to that moment, they start their business is probably recorded everywhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, you know, I've always cautioned my children and I watch myself. I don't, you know, on Facebook, I don't use social media except for like LinkedIn. I don't do Twitter. I don't do any of that stuff because it's so easily taken out of context. And then I think that we're living in a, a hypersensitive culture at the moment that, uh, you know, I've always, when I, when I talk about being authentic or when you talk about authenticity, I've never, I mean, I, I, when I grew up, it, it, it was different, but I went to the army and then I went and I worked for a lot of different companies. I've worked on teams of just men. I've worked on teams, just me and a bunch of women. I've worked on mixed teams. I've worked across all those. I've worked with different genre of people, um, lived overseas for a while. I take people at the face value that they want to show me when they first show me that and just take them for, for who they are. I don't care what you do behind the scenes or you do in your house. Um, it just doesn't bother me. I don't care. <laughs> you can do really what you want. It, it, you know, it doesn't affect me. But I, and, and I think that's how we really need to be looking at things. We have to be very, very careful because um, one, like in the, in the current business I'm in right now, we had one person that went crazy on us and wrote a bad review on Last Doors. And that's like this for like five years. To some extent, people look that up and I'm like, that's just crazy. This, this was just absolutely crazy. Uh, that that post is still up there to begin with. And we worked to try and get it taken down because we did everything right. And then this one individual went out, just slammed them. And, you know, not that it hasn't hurt. We've grown the business very, very well. And it's grown very, very quickly. But, you know, and, and people shouldn't do that. Uh, I, I don't think it. Uh, people should treat other people by judging them. You know, you, you get people to say, well, I'm not judging people within that. They're the ones that are yelling the loudest at people to shut them down. Uh, and I just don't find that's right. We can't, if you don't have a good, you can't have a good conversation if everyone's afraid to say anything or afraid to slip. And I always like to make people, and I think, and I think people are very comfortable around me overall because I don't really hold back who I am. Some people don't like that and I'm fine with that. I don't have to like you either. We can still do business together and still make money and we can still do things, but we don't have to be best friends at night and, you know, go out and, <clears throat> and party and stuff like that together but we can still be uh, very cordial as individuals to each other and we can do business together and we can help each other grow each other's careers. And it doesn't, and, and what does that do? What the, how does that hurt you? I, and I don't understand that. So, so yeah, I, I think you have to be, I still think you have to be very, very careful. Um, we're penalizing people for uh, doing stupid things when they're in college and we all do stupid stuff when we're in college or when you're in the army, you do all kinds of weird crap and, uh, <laughs> and you see all kinds of stuff like that. And you have to, 
you have to, and I think we've lost that in our society today, is that we forget that we all make mistakes, that we all do silly fun things or dumb things, but uh, there's no real forgiveness for it. And they want to use that against you just because it's to their advantage, not because of any other reason. It's just because they get an advantage over you or over a certain, a certain thing because they can shut you down. So I, I, I think you have to guard yourself, but... I, I still think you have to be very careful. <laughs> there, there's so much to to unpack, you know, or expand upon in what you said. I want to pick one one aspect, if I may. Well, even if I can't, I'm going to. If you <laughs> say I can't, anyway. I'm going to ask it anyway. I may answer. <laughs> <laughs> you may not answer, but I'm going to ask it anyway. This idea of you don't have to be friends with somebody to do business with them. You may not like them to a certain level, but the businesses, you know, can mesh well together or you need to do a project together with somebody. How do you or can you expand upon that by saying, at what point do you need to feel that you like a person enough to do business with them, or it doesn't matter. I mean, I see that all the time with so many of my clients and stuff like that, and and friends who have businesses. They're like, well, I need that vendor, but I really don't trust that vendor. Or I need that client because getting that client would give me a lot of cachet to get other clients of their size, but... I don't like the way they do business. I mean, how do you factor that, Clint? Or don't you? I, I, you have so much experience dealing with these situations. I would love if you could share some insights on how you make those thought processes. Yes, yeah, so I think it's, I think there's a difference in what you said in the sentence is that I don't trust that company or that person to where I don't have to like somebody or right. something to do business with them. Those are two very distinct areas. So I cannot like you, but I can like your products, the quality of your products. Uh, And even though I don't like maybe you as an individual um, or some of the other individuals at the company, at least you treat us fairly. When we were growing Zenith Infotech and one of the greatest, greatest strengths that I think we had as a company and Akash exhibited and really pushed and we pushed it through the organization was don't, pass responsibility for everything. If we made a mistake and you were there, if we made a mistake and we screwed up a server or someone's backup got hosed and it was costing downtime and stuff, our partners come to us and say, well, you did this and I'm going to see you. I'm going to do this. And it's like, wait a minute, stop. Yeah. Okay. Calm down. We made a mistake. Obviously it's going to cost money, obviously, but let's not worry about that. Let's get the customer going. Let's get them back up, get them running, fix the issue. And then we'll deal with the, the fallout. We can worry about whose fault it was later but let's fix it and just being authentic or being real or being honest about the things that happened. And that went through the industry and there was a lot of trust within the brand and within what we were doing. So that's trust. So you don't have to like my team. You don't have to like Akash or Rajiv or anybody else was in the company. You could have not liked Indians. You could have not liked Americans. You could have not done this. doesn't matter. The brand was there and it, and, it, and it was consistent and we gave a consistent product, a quality product that we backed up. So that's, I got trust. Whereas when you get, when you, when you see that you can't have trust and don't want to do business, uh, some very large companies and I've even seen smaller companies would go out and start selling direct and start taking deals away from the channel. Yeah. We and see that all the time in the we industry. We see that all the time. Those, that's when you're like, no, you don't fit my business model. You don't fit it because you might help me make a little bit of money here. You might help me move forward here, but there's always that part that you're going to come out. And when you pull that big client from me or that other client from me, or you start giving it to somebody else, you're killing my business. And especially in a small business, a small MSP or any other type of small business, even if you look outside the IT industry, that can kill a business of 10, 15 people, one client. And you're in, you know, and you've heard it in big customers. They lose one big uh, accounting client and they have to lay off 50 people. They have to get rid of them. You know, think about that for a small business. So I think what it comes down to is trust is one thing. 
And then liking or disliking someone and not doing business with them is something different. Now, as long as they're being ethical, but you just don't like the person. I mean, there may be some other things that they're doing you don't like, and that would, but that would lead to trust, right? And trust the company that they're with if they were doing certain activities uh, from a business perspective. But I think trust is one thing, and whether I like you or not or the other. So uh, you don't want to cut your left hand off <laughs> just because gotcha. you don't like one or two people at the company. I know, I know some uh, RMM companies and, and some PSA companies that com- companies that just did not like the person that was heading the uh, the company, but the product was the best, and they wanted to stick with it. And the and the, and, the, and that company backed up their product. You, but you don't have to like the person that's running it, right? It's still a good product. All your peers are using it. It's great. It works, and it, it makes it makes a. And you don't have that fear that they're going to do something. So long okay. explanation, like I usually do. But <laughs> no, that's right. Now take that to the client side, right? You know, as you were describing that, I, I definitely had some vendor issues where, you know, you heard the chatter out there that they would come back and start stealing your clients. Mm-hmm. One time I went along with it and I, and they burned me. And another t- going to the client side of the conversation, I remember accepting a client. And there was this little sort of niggling doubt, you know, the hair is kind of standing up a little bit, but I'm like, oh, they were going to pay me really, really well. And I wanted more clients of their size. So I didn't pay attention to some of the chatter that was out there. Mm -hmm. While we had them as a client, the FBI confiscated all their equipment. Wow. (laughs) And you got stuck. (laughs) No well, they, they, they ended up paying us because they needed somebody to put new equipment back in. Okay. But what I should have done is said, okay, pay me all up front, which I kind of did. I said, you have to pay me up front for all the hardware. I won't order anything without it. We put all their equipment in. I should have at that point walked, but I didn't because I was like, you know, it's not always right. Mm-hmm. Just because somebody is you know, targeted by the government or something. It doesn't always mean it's accurate, right? Mm -hmm. But I think I kind of knew it all along. (laughs) (laughs) But you you sometimes don't listen to that. So what would be your advice when it comes to a client thing of not liking or trusting, or you're hearing word on the street, like you mentioned that last door review, you're seeing some things like that. But we all know that people can just be malicious, Mm-hmm. So how, where do you decide that line and what are some things you can do to perhaps protect yourself along the way or ask yourself some better questions or something, Clint? You know, I, I know you've been through this a lot. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yeah. I think it's, uh, there's people out there that you're, you're, or companies or clients that you're going to move ahead with. Um, and there's a, you know, when you have, but when you have that, that that feeling, you have to decide what you want to do with it. Is the risk going to be worth the reward uh, from those on those pieces? But if you're really feeling like that, the back of your hairs are going up, and it's just like really like, oh my god, or this is going to happen. Um, I like to listen to that. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, you have to make those decisions differently. I mean, that's a really good question. <laughs> I'm trying to trying to really just kind of feel my way around it because I I usually give people. Uh, the benefit of the doubt when I first meet them or with a customer. Uh, or let with me, a let me throw a little more in there. You know, yeah. you have a lot of people listening to the show who are starting businesses or mm-hmm. they're in that earlier stage where they're at a cusp of growth. So you want to go grab for that growth. And when opportunities present, you tend to take them more often than not. From your experience, is there some criteria that you use to say this risk is a good risk, this risk is not a good risk with maybe adding this client on or something like that? Does that help add a yeah, little I more think so. to the question? Yeah. yeah, so when you, when you say when people are just starting their businesses out or- Or at the cusp of growth stage. Or the cusp of growth in and, and, and these areas. You have to, what, what's your tolerance for dislike? Uh, so uh, just to back up just for a minute is, and, and what I'm thinking in my mind is that, you know, people buy from people that they like in most cases. They want to work with people that they like. Um, and you can't, 
you can do business with or work with someone that you don't like, but you can't hate them. It can't be completely on the other side, right? Because then it doesn't work either in a business relationship. So to move forward, you, you know, you, you have to have some kind of like or some kind of uh, of, of mutual feeling there and, and be all bought into what you're doing as you're growing a business. But always too, when you're, when you're starting out in the business and you look on taking an investment in, or if you're looking on bringing a partner in, making sure that, uh, you, you need to protect yourself. Just don't go by someone saying, hey, we're, we've been friends. We've been doing business for a long time together. Let's start a company. And then you don't put enough uh, measures in, a, in an agreement to to claw stocks back or to you don't want to lose that control of your business. Right. So that's that's one aspect of it. Um, and then other ones, you just have to. It's just like putting money in the stock market and thinking about what's your risk or tolerance? What's that return that you want on something? And will this client give me that boost? So, for instance, when I was at Zenith, we we jumped in with a big distributor um, as we as we're releasing some other products, and we wanted to be you know, out there in the marketplace. We wanted to be we were just as we were really starting to grow, and it was like, okay, it's time that we get enough publicity out there that every deal or every 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 company out there, every MSP out there that's looking for a change or looking to get into this business, and they're they're looking for an RMM or they're looking for a knock or they're looking for these things. We need to be in every one of the hundred percent of those discussions that they're having with internal teams of who do they partner with uh, to, to provide all these services and the software. Uh, so we went into a business, into some of the big distributors and we spent almost $2 million for a year to do it. Uh, knowing that we weren't going to get what we wanted, what, what would repay that in, insofar as the amount of business and the business uplift that we would get from it from uh, an actual number of partners that were transacting uh, directly from them. But what it gave us was that branding and that, and, and that notoriety that we are not notoriety, but that fame, if you will, that, Hey, we're strong in the marketplace. We've made it, we're, we're making money. We're growing really fast. And now we got this big giant that's brought us in and they're trying to push us and trying to sell us and to do that. And that's, that's what we did it for. And it worked. I mean, not long after that, you know, we were all over every place and, you know, all the channel news had us on there and they had us on there coming up, but then it was like all this big thing. Uh, So that's what you have to look at. I think, are you going to get out of what you want? And is it going to pay for, you know, am I going to feel good about it afterwards? Even if this, this, this entity or this person does kind of try and screw me a little bit, or it doesn't work out like they're promising me. I went in it because I had specific goals that I wanted to get out of that relationship, regardless of, what harm they might be able to do. me. So going into a, a, whether it's a client relationship or a vendor partnership or something like that, going in very clearly on what you're hoping to gain for it. And it sounds like evaluating it along the way as well to make sure that things are still working or if not, you need to back out. It's not just going into it blindly. Right. Exactly. Don't go into it blindly. You can't, you can't like, if anyone goes to like Glassdoor and they see a bad review like that, how many more bad views are they? If just one person's there, that's like after all the hundreds of people that are working for the company or the people that have worked and left, and that's the only complaint out there. It's like, oh, uh, well, you know, are you going to put that much um, stock in it or should you? Um, so, and I think it's like that in any type of relationship that you enter into is that you just don't, you're not going to fully know what's going to happen. But like you said, evaluate it. And you're going to, you know, we all make decisions and we regret some of those decisions, but instead of regretting it, especially in business, instead of regretting that decision, then you have to look and say, okay, what did I miss? What towels did I miss? Or was it just something that this person or this entity went out of business, but there was no way of knowing they were doing good. And then someone did something stupid, like, okay, some, minor person or, or some tech person went and they deleted all their backups and ruined all their stuff. And now they're out of business. You know, that's, that's things that just happen. And those are happenstance. Whereas like you're saying, um, where if you know of these issues, you can even address them. Uh, I've addressed them directly with partners before and other companies that I've been doing business with is be direct. And, and that's what I found. I have many stories where I base, I told a customer to screw off. I said, I'm not doing that. Or, uh, the customer's yelling at me and I'm like, you haven't let, and, and I tell them to shut, shut up. I don't want to hear it. I said, I already, this is what I said before. And you're not listening to me because I said, I'm going to fix this. So stop yelling at me and tell me all these things you're going to do. And that's a risk 
that you have to be willing to accept, not just in business, but in your personal life too, is to, is just to be frank with people, not, not trying to hurt them or, or stuff like that. But when it really means something, you, you have to be forward and ask those questions, ask those questions to your partners. You can ask those. Don't be so afraid that you're going to lose the business when you ask, because I found you get more respect that way. When I question some of my partners about why they did something or why they're doing this or why haven't you done that, um, they respect you more and you have much longer relationships that they want to do business with you no matter where you go or they want to continue to be in your, in that circle with you because you are direct, you are straightforward and you are asking those hard questions. So if you have doubts, just ask. Don't be afraid not to get to business. I love that. If you have doubts, just ask. I, I can't tell you how many times people that I've encountered don't want to have the hard conversations. It's because they're afraid of the reaction that somebody may have towards their question. They're afraid of losing business by asking the tough question, or they're afraid of somebody posting something negative out there because they confronted somebody on something. Mm -hmm. When you go to have those hard questions with, you know, this is in business and personal relationships. I mean, I just had to have three incredibly tough conversations with one person that wasn't delivering on somebody. Um, another person who asked me to look at something and I said, do you want my real feedback or do you want surface feedback? Because I really need to know. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Because it's it's important, right? Because sometimes people really don't want your honest answer. They just want you to say good job. And, you mm -hmm. know, if you want me to put my name to something, then I'm sorry, I'm not willing to say good job if you're going to put my name on something, if it's not. So what would be a suggestion for... And I don't. I, I know you can answer this, but I don't know quickly if you can formulate this, Clint. How would you advise somebody to enter into those conversations that may be perceived as difficult conversations to not perhaps shut somebody down or not have the person asking it back off because of the response they're getting when it's something they really need an answer to. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? The way I'm trying it to, does, yeah, it's, question? it's time and space. Okay. So it's the right time, the right space in many, in, in, in what I want to look for. So like if you're working with dealing with your employees or dealing with your business partner or dealing with an executive, um, I don't, I don't ever like to criticize and, and I've done it in the past and I felt really bad about it because sometimes emotions get out there, but and, and really the correct way to do things is not to belittle someone or tell them I did something wrong there or disagree with them. You can still tell someone they did a good job, but then talk to them later in your office or some other place. So I think one is the space with which you're going to ask those questions or give that feedback to, to an individual or cut off your CEO and ask an embarrassing question or something. It's good to ask those Okay, let's step back from that. So um, it's that it's that space and time when you do it and what's in surround you in the environment. Um, and don't don't beat around the bush. So what I hate is you know, we've all had to fire people. Well, maybe not all of us have, but we've had to let people go. Oh, that was the worst moment of my worst life. It involved life. wine. I'll tell you about it another time. <laughs> exactly. So, but the, the sentence I hate is this is not personal. No, it is personal because it's very personal to the individual that it's happening to. And you have to understand. So you have to go into it knowing that in most cases, most people know that it's coming, but still it's tough. And in most cases, it's going to upset some of the things in their life. Uh, and, and it could be drastic. But in many cases, they come out better on the other side of it because once they get through it and, and they find, because they're not happy, and most of them that aren't happy that you're doing that too, uh, and you're not happy with them. So uh, it is very personal from that standpoint. Um, so then back, back to the other then is you just have to, if you're in the right time in the right space, just say it. Say, hey, I, I got something that I want to discuss with you. Uh, don't you know you don't have to demean them at the same time, but you 
You just have to work with them and you have to get it through because no one's going to be productive if you just don't do it. And you're not going to get what you want out of life if you don't ask the hard questions, whether it's personal questions or uh, you're, you're doing business with someone. Uh, it's such a hard place to be in. And you've been on both sides of the coin where you've worked for somebody else in a very high role, helping found the company and grow the company, but as an employee of that company. And then you've started your own company and grown that, sold that, and now you're with our dear friend Dina Moskowitz at Sazmax Partner Optimizer, growing that company from the beginning as well. Looking at the conversations we were just talking about and growth from wearing both hats, one, you're the buck stops here, to you're somebody guiding, but essentially you are working with somebody else's vision, somebody else's direction, somebody else's formula for the, not really formula, but their, their culture for that company is one easier than another. And how did you manage to switch those hats? Cause I know when I sold my company and went to work for the person who bought it, it was very difficult for me cause I was like not, in the inside boardroom, you know, and I'm being mm-hmm. told to make, to do things versus without knowing all the pieces all around it. How do you wear that hat in those difficult conversations and just navigating it yourself? Own the part of the business that you own uh, is the way I look at it is that I don't have to be the owner of a company, but I'm owning a function, especially when you're, when you're higher up or even when you're, when, even when you're, you just have a, an entry level job. Uh, own that as if it's yours, and take. If if you're in a position that you don't love and you don't want to take responsibility for, you're just there for a paycheck. Uh, go get a job on an assembly line or something like that, or uh, go someplace and work where where you are happy in in, in doing that type of work because um, you're not going to make those kind of you're not, you're not going to ask people those types of questions. So uh, first and foremost, I'd say you. you you just aren't going to grow in that in that way, uh, in the position or in that company. If you're if you're really hating it and you're unwilling to uh, talk about the you know why do we have to do that um, uh, portion, but if you own that portion of business, and especially once you start getting into management, so this is really when you start getting into management, especially upper level management, you need to own what you are given charge of and what you're doing. You don't have to be in every conversation the company has uh, either, but you have to own that. And when people are questioning or they're saying, you have to do this, you have to do that. It's like, now, wait a minute, this is what we're doing. This is working well. What do you think this is going to do? You have to ask those questions because it affects everyone else underneath you. And you'll be surprised in most cases, (laughs) not all leaders are this way uh, or CEOs or owners of companies. They'll respect that and they'll want to, they'll want you to be doing more in that. So if you own that, if you grow that portion of business, but then you also ask the tough questions of your bosses as well as your uh, people that are underneath you um, and treat them the same way that you want your boss to treat you uh, in there is to hear your voice, understand that you are managing that part of the business for the company. Uh, and they should be much more, you know, they, they should talk to you. And, and, uh, and, you know, it's not, it's not like you can ask bitching questions or be complaining. It's about, here's a real business issue. This is what you're asking me to do. This is how it's going to affect it. Cause in many times when, you have someone at the top of the company and they're saying, well, let's do this and let's make these shifts. They have no idea what you do on a daily basis or what your team does on a daily basis. They're relying on you to come back. So it's like, don't be a yes person, you know, come back with, and, and don't be that person that just throws the questions out there, the hard question out there and don't have some kind of semblance of how you would do it or what you think a, 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 a solution is. There's one thing to be just asking questions of people and asking tough questions, but have some type of answer or some type of way that you think it might work. Does that, does that make sense? I mean, yeah. Cause if you're, if you're working for someone and you, you can't be honest with them, um, don't work for them. I mean, start looking for a new job someplace. If that person can't be trusted or that person, uh, is just like, I don't care what your thoughts are. This is a position you're in, shut up and do it. Um, there's time and place for that when you're in the military, uh, and something like that. There's a time and place, right? And there's a time and place for everything. So, okay. Yeah. So, so building off of that, and 
knowing your experience where you've helped over 12,000 entrepreneurs grow their business using products that you've created and you've helped large companies by helping them get the data that they need to determine how their business can grow. Do you think everybody's cut out to be an entrepreneur? No. Okay. Why not? It comes because everybody to, thinks they can be an entrepreneur. So I'm curious. Yeah. I mean, to, to a certain level, maybe they could be, but to, you know, and maybe that's not, wouldn't be the term of an entrepreneur. So no, I don't think because it, it requires a very high risk tolerance. Um, most people aren't going to put their house online or put their, their life on hold. I think a very big difference, I think the biggest difference is when you look at the executives in these companies or like what I was in Zenith, at Zenith Infotech, I wasn't, I wasn't working for a paycheck or, or the company wasn't paying me for my hours. The company was paying me for a portion of my life. And Zenith Infotech was my life. I oh, traveled yeah. 80% of the time, 85% of the time. And that was my life. And really, you know, I did, I put my family first every, at every chance I could and, and God, but that way they were buying a, a large chunk of what they were paying me of my life. And when you start a company and you become an entrepreneur and you're really starting to grow that business, that's your life. That's part of who you are. And if you aren't putting that into it, you probably aren't going to grow it. Uh, I know we see all these things on all these shows on TV that make it look so easy that I can grow a company and I can start out sewing here and we're making these little dog treats. Uh, you're still an entrepreneur, I guess. You're a business person if you're doing that. You're making your dog treats and you're and you're, you're walking dogs and doing things right. That's, so that's and there's a lot of MSPs out there or IT companies out there that they really have a lifestyle business and that's fine. But they've grown a, a million, two million dollar business. It's, 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 it, you know, it's doing a lot of, it's, 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 it's employing people. So yeah, they're business owners, but I think the real entrepreneurial piece uh, and what, and I think what you're talking about is when you get up that bigger space, you're selling your life, if you will, the company's purchasing your life. And I think that's the different mind frame because you can own a business and you can do very well in business, but it's not necessarily your life. You might love it and you like doing it, but it's not necessarily your life. I think it was Jameson West, who we both know through the... Oh, he's tech. fantastic, yeah. Um, yeah he guy. recently wrote a book about selling your business and, mm, and the I emotional that, yeah. component to all of that. And I think it was on a show I did with him where, you know, he really talked about everybody wants to be an entrepreneur, but the majority are really small business owners. Mm -hmm. And small business owner used to be an incredible turn. I own a small business. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, I think with the advent of Shark Tank and all of those things, it became, no, you have to be an entrepreneur. Do you think there's really a difference between a small business owner and an entrepreneur? And if so, what do you think that difference is? Is it that ownership thing? Because I see small business owners that seem to put a lot of hours into their businesses as well. They do. And I think that I'm not, I'm not going to say they're not entrepreneurs from that perspective, because, you know, they did, they, they have put a lot online, but uh, at the same time, they they have a business to make because they would make, I, I know a lot of them <laughs> that have small businesses that'd be making a lot more money working somewhere else, you know, and, and uh, you know, I know guys that were running a small MSP that were making 75, $80,000 a year running that, uh, and they liked doing it. They liked having that freedom. So that was what it was about. So it wasn't necessarily about the money, right? Because they could have been somewhere else working and making 150, 250,000 or more dollars with their skill sets. So, but from, I think there's a lot of, so if you look at the MSP community and those those folks that really want to be, that are, I guess, I, I guess it's, are you a good entrepreneur or are you not? And that comes down to the risk factor I talked earlier. I'll, I'll go stick with that. It's a risk, risk factor because in, in a small MSP, as you grow, at some point you hit a wall at about a million, five, two million, and there's certain things you have to do to your business and you need to bring the right people in. Are you willing to give away some of that equity? Are you willing to give up some of that money that's coming in to bring that type of individual that's going to help you arrange the company then to get to your four million or your 3.5, your four million? Now you're, now, you're, now you're facing another set of challenges and are you going to overcome them? 
Um, so again, it comes down to risk. Um, yeah. Okay. All right. That has me thinking in so many different ter- directions. <laughs> I mean, it's, which you, you know, always I'm not do. To be I'm not trying to be convoluted. I don't want to take away from people, <laughs> business owners. No, you, you will, every time I have a conversation with you, you make me think, which is just one of the myriad of reasons why I love you so much. Um, trying to f- build off, off of that, uh, what I kept thinking of is you're talking about with, with Zenith, you were traveling 80% of the time and basically they paid you for your life and, and giving up your life and that entrepreneurs need to do that. You, everything I've known of you beyond the Zenith, right? You've, you love the outdoors, okay? You love being out more in nature. And family is very important to you. You put a lot of that aside with several of the positions you've held over the years. I feel like now you are trying to balance that world out i'd almost at times clint call you a light luddite somebody who doesn't really like tech but understands it has a role (laughs) but you'd rather just go off the grid and go play out in the woods somewhere and and just enjoy a more simple life so how do you balance that now with this person that for decades lived for work that's a work unto itself um and where i want to be in in five years from now is out of my property and have a house and have my solar energy not be not be attached to the grid whatsoever and when i when i'm done with this 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 will be just like out the door i don't want to have one uh to an extent right and i say that now but it's kind of tongue-in-cheek right um you want it when you want it not Constantly well, attached. Well, right, but the giving up that portion of my life that I've that I that I've put into the companies and put into things. There's a lot of enjoyment that comes into that too. Like so, we grew Zenith Infotech, and uh, that ran to you know we were eighty some million dollars sold it, and uh, it's still in business today. So ConnectWise now owns it. Uh, it changed its name, and, and but everyone knows it. And there's still a lot of people working. There's great people there, like Ray Rabel and Marie Salon and. Uh, a lot of the people that went there, and I, I hear from different people like uh, 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 Derek and, and all these, and, and Mike, and all these people that we, we get back together. They're at their own businesses, and we do business together, uh, mm-hmm. or at least we talk and, and things like that. So that was that was an ecosystem that that we created, uh, pretty much created the, the BDR, the whole concept of the BDR. Is we 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 launched that along with a guy by the name of Andy Benzinger, and. Um, you know, we, we had that vision and it was a lot of fun building that, <laughs> you know, I mean, we went from in about seven years, we went from zero to eight to 80 million uh, and, you know, several hundred employees and it got sold. So you were really building a, a, a wonderful ecosystem. So I enjoyed that. Um, and it gave me the capability to uh, own some property. It gave me the capability to, to do some of the things that I, I want to do as well. So, um, so I don't think I've lost. By doing that, I think, you know, there's there's times that I've lost that were kind of the uh, maturation uh, years of my daughter, which I don't think did her any favors when I look back. Um, but she's she's very well balanced, <laughs> anyways. But yeah. uh, and then uh, you know, and my son, he's worked in some of the businesses with me now, and he's working for me again, and so that's that's all great experiences to have. So I'm still. Mixing a little bit with family <laughs> as, as we go. And uh, and it's also given me the financial capabilities to do the things that I want to do. And, and I think, I, I don't know if it, who it was that said that, but, you know, uh, find find a job that provides you, if you of all you want a job and you don't care about the other things, is find a job that is going to provide you enough, enough freedom to be able to do the things that you want to do. And it maybe even eventually turn that into what you do in the future, so... I love that. That's a great way of thinking. And Rodney Hall just uh, joined hey, us from, from LinkedIn and he's like, I remember Infotech. <laughs> so, hey, Rodney. Um, all right. You know, I, I look at all of your different careers and we're getting towards the end of the show. And 
one of the things that I know that you're you're doing and focused on right now with where you're working right now with Sazmax Partner Optimizer is the focus on data. Okay. And I feel like over the course of your career, data has really played a prominent role in helping you grow other businesses and and helping you as a person build relationships with with data. Can you explain how data is factored into your life and how my listeners as entrepreneurs, as business owners, or we have a lot of people that are working for other people as well watching, um, what should they look for in their businesses to help them make better decisions for their business and for their personal lives? I know it's a little bit of a departure, but I feel like it's a great closing thought because you're, you're such a, I've seen you use data amazingly over the decades I've known you. And it's been decades. You realize that? Multiple yeah, yeah. decades. Why don't, why don't you yeah, age me here? <laughs> well, uh, age me too. I'm well, older no, than you. But it's, but it's great. You know, I mean, if you look at the ride that we had together, because we shared this journey, we shared it with thousands and hundreds of other managed service providers and the I remember when we were the first company to sponsor our Heartland Technology groups, and uh, there was only three groups then, and uh, you know, and, and we just grew there. And I think that was kind of the start of really understanding the use of data. Was Arlen, uh, God bless him, he uh, he let me sit when we first sponsored him. He let me sit in everyone's in, in all three groups, and then even up when it was still six groups, I was I had an invite. I went and I I sat in every three days I sat with all those business owners and listened to them. And then and I was able to start participating and I started to understand a lot about the managed service provider model, which really helped us at Cena to really understand how to work with them because I started to understand how they made money, how they looked at it and was able to collect this kind of data and then uh, actualize that data in how it is that we helped a managed service provider grow their business. And I could turn that into dollars. So from a from a sales perspective or a value perspective that you're providing to your clients out there, if you really have the data that you can understand what it is you're doing for them and turn it into a dollar piece. And, and I've told a lot of people this before is if you can turn your product into a dollar and if I were giving people $20 and they were giving me five every time they do it, right? And they give me five bucks, I give them 20. They do it all day long. So how do I turn my product into they're making money from it or they're, they're driving profit out of it. They're driving, they're, they're mitigating risk. They're, you know, so uh, there's a lot of areas and data there. I think the data out there today, <clears throat> there's a lot of data and I can't talk for every industry out there. I can, I can specifically talk a lot about the IT industry. Um, I've learned a lot about the MarTech industry and uh, a lot about uh, the marketplaces that are out there and SaaS and, that's, what I, that's where I'm working now in, in those particular areas, but with the data underneath it and data about specifically about partnerships. And you'll hear, so we're one of the channel t- uh, tech stack companies uh, and uh, Forrester has named us in, in their grid of, of channel stack companies. We, you have to understand and look at the data and, and truly understand what it's going to do for you if you can, because there's lots of data out there like in, intent to buy, um, there's all kinds of other statistics are out there. What are those key pieces of data that you really need to make sure that those that the data that you're buying from someone or the data analytics engine that you're buying, what's that base data that makes your company run? So when I hear intent data in channels and I hear those things, it's like to me, it's like, okay, that's fine. But what we do is as a company today is we basically build DNA profiles of companies that resell, MSPs, IT companies, the, the global integrator, all these companies. We build these DNA profiles that really talk about who the company is. If you don't know that a company is aligned with your channel programs, if they're not aligned with your vision, if they're not aligned with your go-to-market strategy and your route to markets and your buyer personas, none of the other data matters in that perspective. And I think that really goes down to any type of client or any type of business is really understanding that buyer persona, I think most people call them, uh, we call them the channel persona, 
or the partner persona, partner profile that most aligns with you. And then that's who you want because the, the days, I think that the days in our industry of just going out and saying, I'm going to beat my head in a brick wall because that's what we did. And I did it over and over and over again and uh, isn't there. So you, that data is like the cornerstone that all other pieces of data in the channel should be utilized to make sure that they're getting the most out of the, of the other data sets that they have there. So I think I can't necessarily put, say, here's how you're going to use the data because I don't know who you are. I don't know what you're doing uh, in your business, but just make sure that the data points that you're getting are really those ones that are key to the life's blood of who you are as a company first and foremost. What is that? If you're going to build a house, don't build the roof first and then try and lift it up there later. Uh, build the basement, understand what that, what that cornerstone is of the data that you need and require to really understand the different comings and goings of different parts of the business. And then how does that relate? Ugh, and that's, I love that. That's really yeah. great. If you don't have the, if you're not looking at the right data, it doesn't matter. Yeah. You can go out and buy this, this great data that everyone's doing really, really great with. Uh, and, and, and I say intent to buy and all these other things. There's lots of data out there you can buy, right? You can buy contacts, um, you know, so you can go and you can buy a bunch of contacts and you can start marketing to them. They don't matter. Uh, the contact doesn't, and, and I'm going to say this, contacts are very important uh, and having the right contacts are very important, but it's more important is where they're working. Is that in alignment with you and with your company and the verticals you're selling into and, and working with? So it's, it's very important if they're the HR director and that's who you need to talk to, right? But still, are you still in alignment with what they're trying to do as a company? I think is, is also very, very important. Whether you're looking at clients, whether you're looking at partners, whatever it might be, make sure that you're, that's great, Clint. You can't walk into a manufacturing company and sell them an ERP system for a doctor's office. Right. Just because that person has the name of whatever title that the same person over here does that you sell to here, it doesn't mean that your product fits here, right? And a lot of SaaS, a lot of SaaS products are hyper-targeted onto just dentists or on just to uh, manufacturers of cars or, or this side or auto parts, you know? So yeah. Very important. Okay. <laughs> We're almost out of time. I, I know that you only communicate social media wise on LinkedIn. Would it be okay for people to reach out to you on, on LinkedIn if they had some mm -hmm. follow up questions or whatever? Sure. Absolutely. Okay. Happy to, yeah. That's how, that's what LinkedIn's for, right? Now you're in your yeah. building, you're, you're, we're going to build that network together. So, you know, feel free to reach out. I love to talk to people about their business. And, uh, you know, can I talk interesting in what you're saying is in, in helping companies. I actually helped a local butcher here. I, I did some consulting with him about his store and about his butcher shop and his little uh, grocery store. And I said, you know, well, you, you have people walk in here because they want your meats and they want this and they want the other thing. And right there is the deli when they walk in. The rest of your store doesn't get any traffic. They all come right here and they buy. So I said, put your cheese and put your, all your meats and all your other stuff in the back corner and make them walk around there so you get more traffic through the other aisles. And that helped them out a lot. And I also told myself, you know, I said, people come here because I come here to your store because you know so much about how to cook meat properly or to do the fish or to do the thing. I said, and your personality that you're sharing this with people, they come here also because of your personality. They come out of who you are. So on your social media, do some videos, do some of this, do some of that. And uh, they're, they're going gangbusters. Not that I can put all the credit there. I didn't grow the company. I just spent a couple hours with them. But so, but that, that's fun. <laughs> I always thought that if you decided to leave the other things you're doing, you can make an incredible career helping businesses grow because that's really what you do. I get, yeah, that's what people tell me. <laughs> I get, and I get, it's true. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, I can see you doing a hyper local business where you help local businesses just take over their areas because you care so much about the relationships and the people in your communities. And you're incredible at the much, much bigger stuff, the national and international stuff. You know, I see that with you all the time. But anyway, that's a side for another conversation. Well, thank you for having <laughs> me here, Laura. I just want to tell everyone, thanks for coming here. Laura's a, a wonderful business person herself. She's done fantastic stuff in her in, in her life from a business career and having these books out there. She's helped so many women as well. I know she works a lot with women in channel and uh, everything. And uh, if you have kids out there, the channel's here to stay. Get them in the IT world. We're, we're lacking really great young people coming into uh, in this space called the channel. And 
the IT channel is going to be a lot of money be made over the next uh, 10, 20 years in this industry. So make sure you're you're talking about that too. Yeah. And Clint, you're going to have to show this interview to that butcher in town. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Thanks so much. Get for- three steaks out of it. That's for sure. Yeah. At, at least. Good. <laughs> At least, Clint. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, thank you so much for being on the show and just for being an amazing mentor and supporter in my life. I don't believe I'd be where I am without you in my life. So thank you. Same here. Yeah, it's people like you that we work together with. It, and there's there's thousands of them out there that we've all touched. So it's great. Yeah. I'm sending you a big hug, my friend. All right. I hope you got a lot out of that, everybody. I could ask Clint questions for days and he's just one of these people you want in your life. Check him out on LinkedIn. If you are in the tech world and in the channel, you definitely want to check out the cool work that Clinton's doing today. And I hope you have somebody like Clint in your life, whether it's in your personal life or in your business life. If you do share who that is out on my social media and about the show, let me know what you're thinking because at the end of the day, the right questions can change your life. Have a great day, everyone. You've been listening to It's All About the Questions, starring Laura Stewart. Connect with Laura at itsallaboutthequestions.com and download a free workbook that will help you ask better questions starting today.